The secret sauce for us on the day of the Olympics, Gary, we did two things better than the rest of the field because we were not bigger, faster, or stronger than the rest of the field. We were the smallest doubles canoe team in the race. What we did better on the day of the race was we corrected mistakes a little more quickly and a little more effectively than the rest of the field. And we anticipated mistakes before they happened a little bit better than the rest of the field. And I know that doesn't sound very sexy or interesting, but if I said that's what will get you a gold medal at the Olympics, and I won't say that that'll happen every time, but that happened for us. Mistakes only know one direction, and that is to get bigger, stronger, and faster. So the more quickly that you correct them, not only do you save more time and effort in the process, but they're just easier to correct when the mistake is still smaller. And that was it. That was the secret sauce for us. And so what I always say about aiming for the rocks, there's opportunities in confronting the obstacles. Yes, they look scary, but here's the river hydrology truth about confronting obstacles. When water piles up on a rock from the upstream side of it, it's just energy. It's got to release at some point. So the water that releases around the sides of the rock often releases at a pace that's faster than other parts of the river. So if you can align your boat and paddle and body close to the rocks, you'll often be in water that is deeper, faster, and more helpful to you in your life. You don't get there unless you're willing to confront the obstacles. So aim for the rocks. My name's Dr. Gary Crotez, and I'm a coach, podcaster, and award-winning author of The Idea Mindset, a book about how to figure out what you want and how to get it. The unlock moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead. When I'm in conversation with my coaching clients, these are the breakthroughs that are so profound that they remember vividly where they were, who they were with, what they were thinking when their unlock moment happened. In this podcast, I'll be meeting and learning about people who have accomplished great things or brought about significant change in their life. And you'll be meeting them with me. We'll be finding out what inspired them, how they got through the hard times, and what they learned along the way that they can share with you. Thank you for joining me on this podcast to hear all about another Unlock Moment. Hello, dear listener, and welcome to another episode of the Unlock Moment podcast. Now, to date here on the Unlock Moment, We've had world-leading coaches, top CEOs, high-growth entrepreneurs, world-class dancers, a movie star, a Nobel Prize winner, and an astronaut. High-performance leadership comes in many forms. Today, I'm delighted to welcome the first Olympic gold medalist to feature on the Unlock Moment. Joe Jacoby is an Olympic gold medalist CEO, performance coach, and author who guides high-performance leaders to ignite their second wind to confront challenging midlife transitions with meaning and adventure. Back in the Barcelona Olympics of 1992, Joe won America's first ever Olympic gold medal in the sport of whitewater canoe slalom, competing with his canoeing partner, Scott Strasbourg. These days, he's back in that same part of the world where he lives in a mountain home in the Pyrenees. In 2022, Joe published his first book, Slalom, Six River Classes About How to Confront Obstacles, Advance Amid Uncertainty, and Bring Focus to What Matters Most. It's full of Joe's reflections, experiences, relationships, and strategies on how more than 40 years on the river transferred to navigating your river, perhaps your slalom of life. I'm looking forward to hearing Joe's take on what it takes to become an Olympic gold medalist, the challenges he faced after retiring from the sport, and how he got his life back on track. And of course, I'm curious about the unlocked moments of remarkable clarity that helped him to figure out the path ahead. Joe Jacoby, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the Unlock Moment. Thank you so much, Gary. I'm so excited to be here and to dig into this conversation with you. I think it's going to be fascinating. Now, they were showing the Whitewater Canoe Slalom World Championships on the TV here in the UK the other week, and it blows me away how the athletes can tame the rapids and pick their way down the course without losing control. It really is living on the edge. It's no surprise that you've shaped a career around helping people through your performance coaching, but where 
Where really do we need to start in your story to understand the person you are today? Well, I think it's great that you referenced the world championships at Lee Valley being on television and these athletes navigating a force of energy that is beyond their control and working the best they can with that. So in answering that question, uh, Gary, I would actually take you back to my childhood. There is nothing about me that would have put me on a course for being an athlete. In fact, like I, I was not the fittest I was far from it, uh, being the fit, you know, one of the fitter kids, like when I was eight, nine, 10 years old, I love sports, but I thought I was destined to be a good sports spectator. I thought maybe work in sports media at the time, sports talk radio was a thing. I would not have pegged myself to have been an athlete. I, I was overweight. I it wasn't agile. I wouldn't say that I had like that toughness that goes along with sport. But I think one thing that happens with kids, I think we'll talk about a few kind of unlock moments within this podcast, but I would say where this starts for me is that when I was 10 years old at summer camp, I was the first in my group to learn how to do the Eskimo roll in a kayak, which means when you flip upside down in a kayak, how to turn the kayak back upright with yourself still in the boat. And it's a tricky maneuver to learn. And I had never been the first at anything in my life to that point in an activity. And people are saying, hey, that's so great. That's a really hard thing to do. And you're the first one in the group to do it. And I I had never had that kind of feedback before. So I would say like that was kind of a really big shift for me and kind of being like, hey, maybe I actually could be someone that doesn't just know a lot about watching sport, but could actually do this sport. And I think that became a really big part of my identity, especially during the summertime, 11, 12, 13 years old. And I really took to kayaking and things really started to kind of take off from there. Really interesting. And and as you went through that sport, so my regular listeners know that I used to be a professional ballroom dancer. And I actually, you know, I started in ballroom dancing when I was four years old and was competing from the age of nine. In the ballroom dancing world, there's no money in it. It's, it's something where kids are being taken around the country by their parents to school halls to do their little competitions and so on. And even as a high-level amateur or high-level professional, hardly anybody is making significant money as a competitor. What does that look like in the slalom canoeing world? Is there, is there decent money as you get good at it, or is it still a struggle for the competitors? Um. You know, I think it's changed in some countries. You know, for example, in the United Kingdom, canoeing, both the flat water and the canoe slalom, as well as rowing, I think are pretty well supported by the lottery. And I don't want to say that this is like a career decision for a lot of these athletes. I I think this is a really hard sport to do if you don't enjoy doing it. But conversely, like if I were to look at the Irish program that has almost no resources going into it, and I look at their performances from the world championships, like I think it's really fun. And maybe this also kind of conjures up memories for you about this idea of doing it really for the love of the game. And I think as sports start to elevate and you start to kind of move up the pyramid, you may notice that not everyone is in it for the love of the game. I think as more resources and more opportunity comes up, I, I think that's a fair consideration to take a look at. For us in the United States, especially during the time that I was growing up, yeah, this was a labor of love. And, and a really funny thing that even carried over into my executive experience in the sport of canoeing when I was the chief executive officer of the U.S. Canoeing Federation, and we started to have important conversations about talent identification and talent development in the sport of canoeing. We had a great coach that started to think about like, what are the kind of skills that an athlete really needs to excel in the sport of canoeing? Is it like a certain kind of body type? Is it a certain kind of disposition or muscle flexibility, fast twitch, slow twitch, all these kind of things? And there was, this, there was this other coach in the United States that was coaching at the time. And I remember him telling me, this whole talent identification program is so stupid. You know, and, it was, and he said, you know, the first thing that you need to test 
funny enough, is like pouring like a bucket of ice water over the athletes and to see who enjoys that. <laughs> and what he was saying on some level, and this is true, this is absolutely true still in the United Kingdom as it is in Canada or the United States. If an athlete doesn't enjoy being on the water when it's like freezing cold and it's like just on the cusp between rain and snow and you don't really enjoy that, it's just not the sport for you. And it's like you could have all these things that suggest you to be a good athlete and one day you may have the resources to spend the year traveling to avoid winter. But when you're a kid, you can't. You know, you got to stick it out in Nottingham at the National Water Sports Center showing up for workouts at seven o'clock at night when it's already been dark for three hours, it's cold, it's raining, it's November. And if you don't like enjoy going to the National Water Sports Center in Nottingham at that hour, it's really hard, I think, to excel in the British system. Like if you're not that kind of person that like would enjoy that. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting way of thinking about talent, you know, development and kind of looking at that sort of love for the sport. Mm. And of course, most of us, are watching our sport and we're watching the game, the match. We're, we're watching the end product. And we're, you know, as people show up and they, they might be the world's fastest sprinters or they're amazing football players, rugby players, tennis players, canoeists, dancers, whatever it is, you have no idea if you haven't been somewhere in that kind of world how much blood, sweat and tears is involved right up to the moment before they walk out on that track or that pitch or that oh, yeah. you know course or that dance floor whatever it is that that's taken them to to that stage and i think people are really shocked sometimes then when they hear what people put themselves through to make it to not just to be really good in their sport but the absolute elite peak of their sport it's it's a really different mindset and i'm fascinated to work with people who have that kind of you know this isn't about getting to a high performance state. This is getting to an ultra high performance state. You need an ultra high support environment, but you also need ultra high challenge because there's lots of people who are really talented out there. For you, when you were transitioning through, coming through in the sport, do you remember a time when you suddenly went, you know, actually, maybe the Olympics is, a, is something we could go for. Maybe I could become an Olympic medalist. Maybe I could become an Olympic gold medalist. When was that for you? And, and was that a shift in your mindset? So actually, this is a nice sort of carryover from the last part of our conversation about sort of your love, you know, love for the sport. One of the things that was interesting about our sport, the whitewater canoe slalom was it was on the Olympic program first time 1972. And then it was off the program for 20 years. And then it was re-added to the program in 1992. The flatwater canoeing had been on the Olympics every year since that there was an Olympic game since 1936. So we were much newer and undeveloped relative to the Olympic program. So at the time that my doubles canoe partner and I, we started paddling together when I was a senior in high school, Gary, and canoeing was not an Olympic sport. And by the time we won our first medal at a World Cup race in 1988, still not an Olympic sport. And then in 1989, officially added to the Olympic program. And we sort of get through that year, 1989, we add a couple of more World Cup medals to our resume, including winning our first World Cup race. And now the Olympics are three years away. Our sport's on the program and we're pretty good. Like not the best, but we're pretty good. So it was interesting to answer your question very specifically. Like we were always just motivated to be the best we could be. And if that meant being world champion, great. If that meant the opportunity to be Olympic champion, great. But I think it really on the day of the Olympics, it wasn't even about being Olympic champion. It was still going, you know, down to the, uh, the canoeing venue here in La Seo d'Orge where I live and just doing the best we can, because that's all that we can control at the end of the day. So it was interesting. Like I never started this with an Olympic dream. That is different for a young person in the U.S. or the United Kingdom today because canoeing is a bit more anchored onto the Olympic program. It's been there for a while. There are systems, there are infrastructures, and it's a lot more predictability to the performance models as well. So for me, 
that idea, of course, I went to bed, you know, fell asleep with the idea of like, oh, what would it feel like to stand on an Olympic podium? Not until just the last couple of years before there, you know, that actually happened. One of the fascinating things about sport is that in some sports, the the final, like in football, you know, the final's 90 minutes. So it's quite a significant period of time and all the experiences and all the emotions are, are filled into that. But in something like canoeing or sprinting, something like that, the moment in your life that might define decades ahead can be a few seconds, a few minutes. For yeah. you, I mean, how long was your winning run down the slalom canoeing course? Um, 122.41 seconds. <laughs> so a little over right. two minutes. Right, right. That was the winning time at, at, at the Olympic Games was uh, 122 seconds, 0.41. It's amazing, isn't it? And, and what do you remember of that run? I remember quite a bit about the run, but I will tell you, I, I remember a lot about crossing the start line. So I remember everything that happened before the run. I remember quite a bit about the run itself. And then almost everything that happened after we crossed the finish line is, is a fog. I have very few memories of either the day of what happened after we crossed the finish line. Mm. And by the way, when we crossed the finish line, we weren't the winners of the race at that stage. And I can explain that in a moment too. The race itself was really interesting, and, and, and I love sharing this with people because I think it's a really different perspective on success at the high performance level. Because I think people believe like you have to do something super incredible, super amazing, super gritty, super resilient, super something. And what was really interesting, the, the secret sauce for us on the day of the Olympics, Gary, was we did two things better than the rest of the field because we were not bigger, faster, or stronger than the rest of the field. We were the smallest doubles canoe team in the race. So there's two people in our canoe, and I'm going to use pounds, not kilograms here, but um, we were of the 17 doubles canoes in the race. We were the lightest team in the race. We were one of two teams that weighed under 300 pounds. Everyone else closer to like 350, 375 in combined weight. So people are a lot bigger and stronger than us, which means being good in our sport isn't a function of your own power. It's your ability to align well with the power of the river, which is always going to be stronger than you and me. So that's why like small, light people can do really well in our sport. But getting more granular on how we did it, knowing that we weren't bigger, faster, stronger than the rest of the field. What we did better on the day of the race was we corrected mistakes a little more quickly and a little more effectively than the rest of the field. And we anticipated mistakes before they happened a little bit better than the rest of the field. And I know that doesn't sound very sexy or interesting. And if I said, oh, that's a good way to have like a nice run down the Olympic course, people would go, yeah, that sounds about right. But if I said, like, that's what will get you in a gold medal at the Olympics, and I won't say that that'll happen every time, but that happened for us. And I think we really underestimate the idea of, of course correction and how good we can get at course correction and why I think it is interesting for people in all other industries to be asking themselves, like, why don't I course correct and sort of get the boat back on track a little bit sooner? It saves a lot of energy, a lot of time, and a lot of resources. Mistakes only know one direction, and that is to get bigger, stronger, and faster. So the more quickly that you correct them, not only do you save more time and effort in the process, but they're just easier to correct when the mistake is still smaller. And that was it. That was the secret sauce for us. And the more that we continue to do that as we went down the course – the more that we started to relax and the more that we started to enjoy the process and then enjoy the run on the course. And that's what it really looked like we were doing by the end of the second run because we get two runs down the Olympic course at the Olympic Games. They take the better of your two runs. But that's what it looked like was happening for us. And when we crossed the finish line, we had the best time. What was interesting, the reason I said that when we crossed the finish line, we weren't the winners, there were still only one boat goes down the course at a time in our sport. And there were still 10 more boats to come down the course. Anyone that goes faster than 122.41 seconds takes the lead. 
So we're just having to watch now until, you know, the last boat crosses the finish line. So at that moment, you know, when you see us cross the finish line and we put our hands in the air and we're clearly happy and we enjoy the process, people who see it on video say, oh, that's the moment you won the Olympics. And we're like, nope, that's just the moment that we realized we went to the Olympics and had done the very best that we could do. Mm, Really interesting. And when you're talking about course correction, you think about so many sports where essentially you're playing on an almost perfect pitch, you know, whether you think about a football stadium and the way the grass is laid down or a pool or snooker table or a running track. But actually, yours is probably the most extreme in an imperfect course. And so, you know, who better to teach about adjusting and being adaptable than somebody who's doing whitewater canoeing? That's that's something that maybe you've got quite a unique perspective on in in your sport and in responding to circumstances rather than trying to do the repeatable, perfect kind of run down the track. I'm fascinated as a former dancer where when you're dancing with somebody in a competition, the subtlety and the immediacy of the connection between the two of you is absolutely critical to keep things in the way you want them to be and keep it all looking serene and calm and energized and all these kinds of things. How does that work in a canoe pairing where you know, you're both facing the same direction, one of you can see the other, but the other one can't see? How does that work in terms of sort of leading and following? Yeah. And how are you communicating between the two of you as you're going down this course? It's such a cool question, and I'm so glad that you asked it. So nonverbal communication is everything in the doubles canoe when the two people are paddling together. I always say that in the doubles canoe, if you see the two paddlers speaking to each other, what you're witnessing is a lot of talking about the mistakes. You never talk to each other when things are going well. So the idea is that when things aren't going well, you know, how can everyone sort of stick to their role to communicate in nonverbal way? Because by the way, communicating just creates more doubt. It takes energy to do it when you speak. So in our boat, the way we went about this, and it was a struggle getting there, but when we figured this out, like we got really good at doing this, we have roles. The person in the front of the boat is kind of like the eyes, like they can see the water better than the person in the back. So the person in the front is the eyes and is really following the river. And my job in the back position called the stern, all I'm doing is following Scott. So instead of looking at the river, like I'll be looking at Scott's back and shoulders because the movements that he's doing with the paddles really with that he's doing with his body is indicating he's signaling to me what's coming next whether he knows it or not so as an example if he drops his left shoulder which you know he paddles on the right side if he drops his left shoulder and left hand that means he's trying to lower that hand to get the paddle blade out farther away from the boat which indicates a sweep to the left oh I'm thinking he wants to turn the boat a little bit to the left. Well, then I can do a stroke to complement that. And so Scott is reading the water and I'm reading Scott. And we just do that over and over and over again. And I think that becomes the way good high-performance teams communicate. And I do think about the application. And by the way, these are two-person teams doing this on that moving, changing medium that you spoke about. So I do think about ways that people can practice this in more controlled environments, more controlled situations, whether it's for business, whether it's for creativity. I think people are very interested to think about how they will perform under pressure or perform when there's more tension or there's more stakes on the line. It's great. You don't have to put yourself in those positions necessarily exactly to do that. But in mentally, cognitively, you do need to figure out some ways to sort of rehearse that and move your body mechanically through those motions as if that tension was very real. And so, yeah, we had ways of practicing that. And I'm always trying to think of ways to do that for clients as well. I think it's really helpful and and really important. It's like, why leave it to chance to decide like how we're going to show up when the tension arrives, why not find a way to put that into practice so that you can anticipate it a little bit better so that when it happens, you're not feeling like, oh my gosh, I've never felt this before. Maybe that changes to, this is new, but it is, 
I have practiced this, so I do have a sense of what to do. And if you can create that, then we can help our clients create a better disposition for performing. That's such great advice. Really interesting. Now, last year, I had a world professional ballroom dancing champion come on the podcast, and I asked her what was in her mind when she was standing on top of the podium with her partner with the gold medal around mm -hmm. her neck. And I will tell you in a minute what she said. I'd love to know for you, when you were on the podium with the medal around your neck and the anthems are playing, what was in your head at that point? I, I, I did tell you that I, I don't remember a lot of things that happened after the finish line. I, I do remember the award ceremony a bit. I think the big thing there about the award ceremony and the medals is, I think the first way I'd like to answer this, Gary, is, you know, the athlete prepares to go to the Olympics to do the best they can. And the medal ceremony happens so quickly after that, you kind of feel like... I, They've given you a crown and a cape and told you you're kind of like a king's, but you didn't prepare to do that. You just prepared to have a, you know, to paddle the best you can at the Olympic. So it was a nice moment. I think it's one that I'm still trying to get context on, or maybe that context is still evolving and changing even today, 31 years later. I, I mean, I felt good about it, of course. And I felt like there was peace in the partnership with Scott, but I, I don't think there was anything so deep or profound at that moment because it just happened so quickly. Like it wasn't like what we were thinking about when we started that day. It wasn't something we were really thinking about until it was like, uh, you know, we're asking the team manager, hey, uh, who, who brought the, um, the medal ceremony uniform? Because it wasn't us, you know, it's like, you didn't prepare for that. You know, we did what we were supposed to do, which was to prepare to do the best we can in the Olympic Games. And that's so interesting because the reason I'm interested in this question particularly is because like with the observer of the sport, of your run down the, the course, the observer of the medal ceremony will have an reimagining what's in the minds of the people standing on the top step. And often they say, that was the pinnacle of your career when you stood there with your gold medal around your neck and the flag was oh, waving yeah. and the breeze and all the rest of it. Joanne, what she said, she said, this was the culmination of 30 years of hard work, training, and competing through her life. Mm. And she said, the thing that was in my head was, is that all? Is that it? Because before she'd achieved the world championship, it was this thing she hadn't got that was her goal. It was her, the thing that was driving her. And suddenly she was there and she had it. And she was like, now what next? And it was such a fascinating mental pivot in that moment because, of course, there's so few people who can articulate what that feels like because so few people in whatever sport have won world championships, Olympic championships and major tournaments and all that kind of stuff. So, so it's really something where you can offer a unique perspective. Gary, if, if I could just sort of, I, I just want to throw this out there and actually get your feedback on it. Hmm. I think sometimes during these kind of conversations, it's not uncommon to you know, maybe we've been talking or thinking about things very recently and now they're top of mind. And I think you said something I've been thinking about. So one thing that I share with my clients a lot is this idea of it's a performance pyramid of sorts. And if you kind of break high performance into three categories, there's training to train, training to compete, and training to win. And I think our society really obviously puts a lot of priority on training to win and the winning part. It is the top of the pyramid, which is like the top of the mountain, which is the altitude is super high. So the oxygen is really thin and the space to move around is really small. It's such a small part of it. I think people are surprised that if we really open up that pyramid over even a 30 year career, that the time you spend in training to win mode is like 10 to 15% maybe and 80, 85% is going to be in that training to train and training to compete mode lower down the pyramid. And that is different. And that's a lot more where more people exist also. Now, here's the part I wanted to kind of throw to you because that might make sense, but I've been having fun with this lately. Imagine we turn that pyramid upside down now and we put that base level up top 
And we said, what if we celebrated training to train like we celebrated training to win? So like there's a part of me as an Olympic champion that just appreciates all the people that did the sport that it wouldn't be worth anything. Like if you couldn't appreciate all the people that made it possible, it takes everyone to make the sport. We can talk about Kipsoji when he runs a great marathon, but what does it really mean if we're not talking about the people that are walking across the finish line five and a half hours, six hours later that have just given everything they can and it means something to them as much as it means to the winner if we don't figure out ways to celebrate that like well then it is that is that it kind of feeling to it so i think when you were turn that pyramid upside down and you put training to train on top and i'm not saying like that's a permanent thing but i was just curious like how that kind of lands with you it's just something i thought about in the last 48 hours yeah, I love that. I love that perspective. I think that in the dance world that I come from, because and unless you are in the very top handful in the world in, in your discipline, there's little in terms of financial success that's different between being in the top 20 in the world and top 50 in the world, top 100 in the world. It's not actually much different. And so in reality, everybody's in their own competition. And I remember a moment in our dance career where we were, you know, we, we were good. We represented our country at world championships, but never at the top end of the podium. But I remember a moment of talking to some of the very top couples where they knew they were going to be in the top three, for example. To beat the fourth place couple, the fifth place couple, the sixth place couple was, didn't feel like any achievement because they just said, well, we always beat them. You know, we're, we're significantly ahead of them. But the couple who were 20th, they went, well, we expect to beat the 40th place couple, but it's a huge deal for us to beat the 25th place couple or the 18th place couple. And we realized that actually everybody's just in their little window of, you know, there's people slightly better than me, there's people slightly worse than me, I'm just trying to beat the people slightly ahead of me. And one day that might mean I become the world champion. But you are celebrating everybody's performance at their level, like your marathon example. The person who's never run a marathon before and gets around the course in five hours is just as much of an achievement as Chogi running it in two hours, two minutes, arguably yeah. more because they suffered for longer than he did on the day in the heat, whatever it is. <laughs> and what I love about events like London Marathon is that in, you know, in the TV coverage of the event, they celebrate all of the participants and they tell the stories of all of the people. And that mindset that we're talking about, about how to achieve becoming Olympic champion, actually, there's not so much different between that and achieving your extraordinary goal. In my coaching, I often talk about the people that I work with. I say, I like to work with people with extraordinary goals. And an extraordinary goal could be somebody saying, I want to be world champion in what I do. That's an extraordinary goal. I want to be the first person from my country to achieve this. That's an extraordinary goal. I want to achieve a promotion that other people don't think I'm capable of doing. That's an extraordinary goal. I want to start a business when nobody in my family's ever started a business before. Mm. That's an extraordinary goal. So there's something about finding the context for that mindset. And I think what's in that mindset is like your iced water example. There's something about persistence at the times when it's hard, at the times when there aren't other people cheering you on. You're going, I'm going to go back into the studio. I'm going to go back into my study. Yes. I'm going to go back in and do it again, do it more, develop, train, practice, improve, find the people around me that can support me in this journey and keep going even when I don't feel like it. There's, there's something in that. I, I love that. And I think you're also, you remind me of something I think is important as well, is that it's at that moment when you're not hearing all the adulation and support and you can do it. And like it, it's like those days training when it's one or two degrees Celsius and raining and so close to snow. I think that's the point where you have to know what joy in the process looks like for you and be, mm -hmm. and be really fascinated with that, you know, and, and be thinking along those lines. Cause I think if it's very, if you're missing out on the intrinsic parts of it at that moment and it's all very extrinsic, I think it gets really, really hard because I think the other options become like it become very appealing I, at that point. Like what is rational about going out on the river when it's that cold and that rainy and that dark 
it's one of the most irrational things you're ever going to do in your life. But I think that's also part of it. Like the beauty and the joy and the fascination is in the irrational part of it. Yeah. I remember one of the competitions we danced, we did the German Open, which in the ballroom dance world is one of the top major championships. And the first round started at about 7 a.m. And in ballroom dancing, because you have to do hair and makeup as well as prepare yourself physically for the competition, that means you're getting up at three in the morning to start mm. doing all of that kind of stuff. And the first cut after the first round was to take half the couples out of the competition. So they would have something like 300, 400 entries in the competition. They'd all dance in heats around the floor, lots of couples on the floor at the same time. Started at 7 a.m. and they made the cut at about 8, 8.30 in the morning. And we didn't make the cut. We weren't in the top half of all of the couples that were there. And so we're walking out. We're going, we've flown all the way to Stuttgart. We got up at 3 o'clock in the morning to make ourselves look perfect for this competition. And the thing I remember is the breakfast places weren't open yet. And I thought, we've been knocked out before breakfast, <laughs> before breakfast opens. And I was like, okay, if we really want to do this, we've got to be able to work through this and come back next time and, and do it again. And that was kind of the mindset shift for us. We ended up, our final competition became eighth in the World Championships. And, and I remember thinking then, you know, we've done all of this for this moment and we were able to retire on a, on a high in our world, you know, at, at our level but yeah, you remember the times when it was late at night and you were going, we're going to go again. Nobody else can see me do this, but it's important for us. Gary, I think there's something embedded in your story that I also think is maybe worth expanding on, you know, for listeners that are trying to pull lessons and elements of transfer from high performance sport, high performance activity to other activities in life, whether it's business, relationships, health, wellness, art, whatever is that I think it is really easy in the worlds of like ballroom dancing or canoeing to look at the very top people and be like, oh, what are they doing? But you just alluded to something I think is really important too, is that I think a lot of times if you go down the results list a bit, you might find the, the people who went like from 80th to 29th in a year or from 67th to 27th in a year. And that might not be the podium, but that is going to be, I think there's a lot to learn, a lot to take away from improvement at that level. And just because you're not seeing it on TV and the sports podcasts aren't talking about those people doesn't mean there aren't really important lessons. And I think what you said about being eliminated that early and then coming back and making that jump, like whatever that number is, like I can, knowing nothing about your sport, I already know in a year's time, like that's a big jump, you know, just to make that first cut because you've jumped over a lot of people. I don't know how many, but it's a lot. And so then I think you can start to dial in like what allowed someone to make that kind of jump in one year? Because the people that are going from like seventh to fourth, it's nice also, but that's not the same as going from like 89th to 27th. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting on that when I think about that, the biggest shift we made was a mindset shift. And we trained in Italy with a lot of people who were very bold in the way they trained and the way they competed. And the coach that we worked with, or two coaches we worked with, one Italian, one Russian, what they did was they helped their athletes to forget about what other people thought about what they were doing oh, and they said for you this is how you're going to be at your best other people will say oh i don't think that's the way you should be going i don't like that that's how you dance i would have done it differently i would advise you to do it differently and they said you've had all that advice for 30 years and this is where you are now you need to do the thing that's exactly right for you even if you lose and that was the mindset shift it wasn't if you do this, you will become the champion. It was, you need to do this even if it doesn't work because it definitely won't work the other way. And when I'm working with leaders now, I talk a lot about your authentic leadership style. You might not become the world's most successful CEO, but you're definitely not going to become the world's most successful CEO by copying somebody else who's performing to their best. There's definitely something in that. Now, I'm really fascinated to hear more about your journey after you retired from the sport. And I know this yeah. is a lot of the themes that then come out in your book. So talk to me about midlife peak performance and what was your story post-retirement that brought you to this space? And you know, what were the unlocked moments of clarity along that journey that 
helped you figure out the path. So it takes a little while to figure this out, but I mean, if I sort of, I'm 54, I just turned 54 years old, Gary. And, uh, you know, I look back 10 or 11 years ago when I was the chief executive officer of USA Canoe Kayak. I think having those jobs in the Olympic movement, I think it's very easy to get caught up in the game of, you know, your profile, your status, power, control. I don't want to say money. I was one of the lowest paid CEOs in the uh, Olympic movement in the United States. But, um, and I was, I think my life was really messy in a lot of ways at that point in my life. So to say I was sort of my early 40s and I weighed about 60 pounds more than I do today. I was really good at putting everyone else's needs ahead of my own, taking care of everyone else, but not really taking care of myself. I, um, y- you know, was very motivated to try to get this right. You know, I felt like I had been an Olympic gold medalist. And if I can't establish a system for repeating that process, then I- I'm not doing something right as well. And I think a lot of things started to happen during this time. One of the things I'm really lucky about in this, the unlock moment, Gary, was that I kept telling myself, so I was overweight, unhappy. I didn't really particularly enjoy all the people that I was serving in that job. I didn't like a lot of the people. I certainly liked some of them a lot, but there was just a lot I didn't. I didn't enjoy the politics and the bureaucracy and just the, how gamey, you know, the, the whole, system can be. I was really overweight and unhealthy. And I just, the story I'm telling myself, it's like, oh, you're an Olympic champion. You know what to do. You know how to figure it out. And then the other side of me, and this is all a conversation in my head is like, well, great. Well, why the heck aren't you doing something about it? And so finally, a couple of years into my job, things aren't going very well in the job, but the Oklahoma City Boathouse Foundation. I was working in Oklahoma City at this amazing riverfront complex there. And they start an employee wellness program. And I just needed something to kind of break the madness, so to speak. The madness being like, I did okay for the first half of the day. And then by lunchtime, it was either the all-you-can-eat Chinese food buffet or the all-you-can-eat pizza buffet. And having a lunchtime workout program or employee wellness program was great because instead of going to the all you can eat food buffet is like, now I can actually just invest in myself differently. Didn't have a goal to lose weight, just wanted to feel better. And that started to kind of take off. And it was very slow. The results happened, but it was very slow. Like I start to go to cocktail parties and like, I get something to drink and I'd walk up to someone. And instead of talking about work, I would just be like, tell me about a time you were stuck and how you got unstuck. And an hour later, I'd be sitting there listening to the most amazing story that someone was telling me. And I was thinking, okay, I think there's something more to this than just serving America's best canoeing athletes in the Olympic and Paralympic movement. But like, how do we transfer some of these ideas to more people in ways that are helpful? And then as I started to really investigate that, I'm feeling better, I'm getting more energy. And then I kind of realized that this isn't the job for me. I kind of shift out of that job and eventually into coaching. But what that kind of allowed me to do, I don't want to say force me to do, but because I had to choose this, I had to sort of go back to elements in the first half of my life, earlier in my life, why I made certain choices about what I did, why I believed what I believed, how I ended up where I was. So I could go back and sort of make some peace with that so that I could shift into the second half of my life with a little bit more intentionality, with a little bit more peace about what I was doing. And like you've been saying throughout this podcast, for the first time in my life, be the author of my own scorecard. So no one else is doing that for me. And I think that is the essence of midlife peak performance to me. So I love this topic of like first to second half transition of life. I think there's something to it. I know that there's no done for you part of this. Like, Gary, if you want to do it, you've got to walk that path. But you actually don't have to necessarily walk that alone. Like, there is community, there is support. It may not always be a happy 
process. It may not be an easy process, but I, one thing I do feel comfortable saying, it will be meaningful if you do it right. Some people choose to embrace it. And by the way, some people get to 80, 85 years old and say, I, I'm not interested. I, no judgment. It's not for everyone. I just tried to take some of these principles of high performance and apply it to these midlife transitions, whether that's in relationships, whether that's in work and creativity, whether that's in health and wellness, so that we can really start to put the sense of defining what high performance is in the hands of the people and not in the hands of other people. And so this involves what we need to unlearn and, you know, listening to our inner selves, maybe like me for the first time in 30 years, I'd shut down my inner voice for 30 years. I wasn't listening to my inner self. Not easy to do when you haven't done that for 30 years, but you start to do it again. And then you start to kind of find that rhythm and that balance and you stop caring about what other people think. And now we're on to something. Really fascinating. And Bring to life some of these lessons that you highlight in your book that come from your experience as a slalom athlete. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think one that really people enjoy <laughs> a lot is this idea of what I call aiming for the rocks. And, you know, in a river where you've got current and, you know, you've got this force of energy and unlike a basketball game, when things aren't going well, you can just call timeout and say, oh, I don't like the way the defense looks. I want to reset. On the river, you cannot call timeout. The river current doesn't stop. You've got to adjust. And so there's a rock in the middle of the river. It's a stationary object. It looks really upsetting and, and like it would hurt and if you hit it with your boat or your body. And so why the heck would I want to aim for it? Well, what happens for so many people is that we teach ourselves early on is that when obstacles are put in front of us, when we start to take a wide path around the obstacle, we start to get really wide, meaning we get very close to the riverbank. And the, the current over next to the riverbank is horrible. It's like these shallow, rocky shoals and your boat's bumping over the rocks and, you know, you can't take strokes with a paddle because nothing's there. And you realize you're missing the good stuff because the river current's out in the middle. And so what I always say about aiming for the rocks, there's opportunities in confronting the obstacles. Yes, they look scary, but here's the river hydrology truth about confronting obstacles. When water piles up on a rock from the upstream side of it, it's just energy. It's got to release at some point. So the water that releases around the sides of the rock often releases at a pace that's faster than other parts of the river. So if you can align your boat and paddle and body close to the rocks, you'll often be in water that is deeper, faster, and more helpful to you in your life. You don't get there unless you're willing to confront the obstacles. If you've been teaching yourself to avoid obstacles and get further away from them, you're like, no, I'm good over here, bumping over the shallow shoals. People love this idea. And by the way, sort of a bonus of confronting your obstacles, on the downstream side of the rock, because river current cannot pass through a stable object, you know what forms on the backside of a rock is something we call an eddy which is a calm spot of water where you can get, you can take a rest in the middle of the current behind the rock, or you can use it to change directions without going downstream. So it's actually a piece of water that allows you to very naturally shift directions or take a rest. You don't get to being behind the rock in the eddy unless you confront the rock in the first place. So this is a way of saying that, you know, Put yourself in a position to confront your most important obstacles. I think that is a huge source of regret for people when they don't do that. If you teach yourself not to do it, you'll get good at avoiding the rocks. So aim for the rocks. I love that metaphor. I love it. So there's someone listening to this podcast who's thinking, that's me, overweight, unhappy, unfocused, caught in the midlife current, buffeted yes. by the rapids. What's one thing that you would say they should think about doing right now to help to move things forward just a little bit? 
Yeah, it's it's a great question, Gary. So our brains are always shifting to the biggest problem we have in our in our life, right? So let's just say confronting hard obstacles is something that we're not good at. What I always say is like, great, like let's pick a really small obstacle, something that's like really has very low consequence of confronting. Like you go to buy a coffee and they get your order wrong, you know, it's like, you know, how risky is it to go back and say, you got my order wrong. Could I, could I, could it be corrected? The thing is using that muscle of confronting an obstacle in a way that has very low consequence, it's the same muscle that we use to confront obstacle of much higher consequence. So I just want to help people find that muscle and get them to teach their brains to let the muscle know it still exists. I see you there and we're going to start to do some work. So pick some really low consequence, low impact obstacles in your life and start to work with them, start to confront them. Don't go to the biggest problem. Don't go to the biggest, most difficult conversation that you have to have in your life. Find really small ones that you can practice on and start to practice using that muscle in ways that are not going to cost you in a hard, difficult way if it doesn't go well. That's such great advice. Joe, how can people find out more about you and the work that you do? Yeah, I would say for now, just please find me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I'm active there. I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. If you can find Dr. Gary, you'll find me as well since we are connected there. And also maybe in the show notes, I'll put a link to Sunday Morning Joe. So about eight or 10 times a year, not very often, I write these essays about midlife peak performance and I include reflective questions and resources I look forward to sharing this podcast in the resource section there at some time in the future, but we'll put a link to where people can sign up for Sunday Morning Joe. I've been writing that since 2014, but it's just a few essays a year now and people really enjoy those. And uh, I'd love to share that with your audience as well. So we can put a link to that in the show notes. That's fantastic. And everyone should sign up. The unlock moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead. For Olympic gold medalist, Joe Jacoby, it was figuring out how to translate what he'd learned in slalom canoeing to navigating the whitewater rapids of life that helped him to course correct and unlock midlife peak performance. Check out his book on Amazon. It's called Slalom, Six River Classes about how to confront obstacles, advance amid uncertainty and bring focus to what matters most. Joe, thank you so much for sharing your story and your life lessons and for joining me today on The Unlock Moment. Thank you so much, Gary. I had a great time with you today. This has been The Unlock Moment, a podcast with me, Dr. Gary Crotez. Thank you for listening in. You can find out more about how to figure out what you want and how to get it in my book, The Idea Mindset. Find me on Instagram at Dr. Gary Crotez and subscribe to this podcast to get notified about future episodes. Most listeners to this podcast on Apple and Spotify haven't yet hit the follow button. If there's one thing you can do right now to help me out, then please click the follow button. The more followers I have, the better guests I can attract for you to learn from. Thanks again for listening and join me again soon here on The Unlock Moment.